Hello friends, welcome to CEC Live Lectures. Dear friends, today in this session we are going to continue in our series on development biology. Dear friends, this is the last lecture in this series and today we are going to talk on internal fertilization. Friends, for the discussion on the topic, we have with us in our studios Dr. Charu Dr. Rawat. Dr. Charu Dr. Rawat is Assistant Professor in Department of Zoology, Ramjas College, University of Delhi. Dr. Charu Dr. Rawat is a prolific professor. Through her, we always get in-depth knowledge on various topics and issues concerning to the subject zoology. Friends, if you wish to ask questions from Dr. Charu Dr. Rawat on today's topic, then do call us through our toll-free number. Our number is 1-800-110-430. I repeat, our number is one eight double zero double one zero four three zero. All dear friends are requested to call in the last ten minutes of the lecture, as well as you are kindly requested to ask questions relevant to the topic only. Now, I would like to welcome our guest, Dr. Charu Dr. Rawat, once again. Hello, ma'am. Welcome to the lecture. Thank you. So uh, we have been talking about developmental biology and the essence of developmental biology is the fusion of the two gametes to give rise to a new individual. This fusion of two gametes is termed as the fertilization. So we have already talked about external fertilization. External fertilization when the gametes fuse together outside the body of the individuals. Like we see, uh, we uh, followed in the fertilization in an, uh, taking an example of sea urchin. So uh, in that case, basically the eggs are laid outside in the environment, uh, for example, sometimes in water and as well as the sperms are laid outside and the two fuses. So it has its own intrinsic uh, problems and the mechanisms which are uh, used to, to or adopted to solve those problems so that finally the fusion of the gametes and exchange of the genetic material can take place. Today we will take up uh, the example of mammals and we will talk about the internal fertilization. So internal, the learning objectives of this session would be to understand the internal fertilization by taking the example of mammalian fertilization and we will also take up another topic or a, rele or a, a, you know, a relevant topic which is the polyspermy where more than one sperm uh, fertilizes an individual and in certain cases this is not a norm. So to avoid this, there are certain mechanisms that have been adopted and we will talk about the different mechanisms to block this polyspermy. So starting with internal fertilization, when the fusion of the gametes takes place inside the body, usually an oviduct of a female, it is termed as internal fertilization, for example in case of mammals. Now internal fertilization is a little difficult to study. Why? Because first, the simulation of the natural environment of fertilization poses a problem. So we do not really know very well what is the environment or conditions that are present in the oviduct of a female. Now to simulate those environment experimentally so that we can study in detail uh, the different uh, conditions and mechanisms and factors involved in internal fertilization, it poses a problem. The second aspect why it is difficult to study is that the sperm population ejac ejaculated into the female is very heterogeneous containing spermatozoa at different stages of maturation. So when the sperm is ejaculated into the female, they are, uh, uh, they are at different stages of differentiation. So we have already talked about spermatogenesis and we have seen that how uh, the, the, the spermatogonial cells uh, divide to form spermatids and how the spermatids then finally differentiate into the mature sperms. So the development of sperms from the spermatogonian cells follow different stages. Now these stages, you know, they are, uh, it's not that all the spermatogonian cells enter each stage at the same time. They might enter at different times and this difference in the timings is basically that the sperm population is ejaculated into the female is very heterogeneous and therefore they contain spermatozoa at different stages of maturation. Now the first problem here is getting the gametes into the oviduct. Now the female reproductive tract actively regulates the transport and maturity of both the gametes. Female reproductive tract is also responsible because otherwise it just looks that the sperm is ejaculated into the female and sperm because of its motility passes on and reaches the place where the fertilization takes place. But actually the female reproductive tract also very actively regulates the transport and maturity of both the gametes. 
small scale biochemical interactions and large scale physical propulsions are used to get to the ampulla. So, as I said that when we saw that the spermatids differentiate into mature sperms, one of the differentiation was the formation of the tail and this tail is basically for the propulsion of the sperm and this propulsion of the sperm the energy contained by or uh, in the in the mitochondria of the tail and which is dispersed when the tail moves is used for propelling the uh, sperms to reach the place where the fertilization takes place uh, which is termed as ampulla the region of the oviduct where the fertilization takes place as well as there are many small scale biochemical interactions that are occurring. Now, fimbria of the oviduct pick up the oocyte cumulus complex. So, if we look at the ovum or the female gamete, then the female gamete is produced in the ovary and released and then it is picked up by the fimbria of the oviduct and it picks up this oocyte and the associated cells which is termed as the cumulus, oocyte cumulus complex which then by a combination of ciliary beating and muscle contraction is transported to the appropriate position for its fertilization in the oviduct. So, ovum which is released from the ovary also has to reach a certain place in the oviduct where the fertilization takes place as well as which uh, the sperms which are ejaculated into the female body also transports in the oviduct into the uterus and finally into the oviduct where it reaches the place uh, where the fertilization takes place. So, uh, getting the gametes into the oviduct is an important stage in the internal fertilization. The sperm appears to be transported to the oviduct by the muscular activity of the uterus. So, as I said, it is not only the sperm's tail or sperm's intrinsic motility which is responsible for the sperm to reach ampulla, but also the muscular activity of the uterus is very actively involved. Now, we will look at that when the sperm reaches the uh, uh, or is ejaculated into the female body, it is not actually capable of causing the fertilization. It has to undergo certain physiological, morphological and biochemical changes with uh, a phenomena which is termed as capacitation that makes it active. So, capacitation is that the newly ejaculated mammalian sperm are unable to undergo the acrosomal reaction without residing for some time in the female reproductive tract. So, in the external fertilization, we have already seen and heard the term acrosomal reaction. Acrosome is a, is a compartment which is present on the head of the, uh, you know, just inside on the tip of the uh, uh, on the sperm and it contains lot of proteases and hyaluronidases and all those digestive enzymes which are responsible for digesting the membranes of the ovum so that finally the sperm can reach the ovum and in fact all the you know secondary and tertiary layers which are outside the ovum and finally it penetrates the ovum and causes the two nuclei to meet or you know one the sperm nucleus is, in, is uh, uh, injected into the ovum. Uh, so that it can fuse with the ovum nuclei. So that uh, journey from the uh, for, from the part where it just reaches the outside cells to the ovum and final penetration is aided by various enzymes contained on the tip of the sperm in this particular uh, compartment called as acrosome and this entire reaction is termed as acrosomal reaction. So, before a sperm can undergo acrosomal reaction, it had to remain in the, it has to remain in the female reproductive tract for some time. The set of physiological changes that allow the sperm to be competent to fertilize the egg is called as capacitation. So, we have seen that as the sperm is ejaculated into the body, it is not capable of fusing with the uh, egg. You know, it just moves, but it is not. And there is a significance for this process called as capacitation because capacitation leads to the plasma membrane or to the uh, sperm membrane to be labile so that the acrosomal reaction can take place. If, however, because the sperm when ejaculated into the female body and finally it has to travel up to the oviduct, if uh, somehow uh, the acrosomal reaction prematurely take place, then it is going to harm the uterus of the female. Therefore, to make sure that the acrosomal reaction does not take place until and unless the sperm reaches the vicinity of the egg, uh, this uh, capacitation process is, uh, you know, the, that is the significance of the capacitation process which is necessary for the sperm to become functionally active. Four sets of molecular changes are important for capacitation. 
The first is the fluidity of the sperm plasma membrane is altered by the removal of cholesterol by albumin proteins found in the removal uh, female reproductive tract. So, on the tip of the sperm there are cholesterol molecules or you know cholesterol vesicles that are deposited and this cholesterol vesicles are removed by the albumin proteins that are found in the female reproductive tract. So, until and un unless the sperm is ejaculated into the female reproductive tract and it reaches the vicinity of the egg this cholesterol is not moved albumin is in a high concentration around the ovum. So, these cholesterol molecules are not removed and therefore, the sperm plasma membrane is quite sturdy and it does not break open. So, the, the removal of the cholesterol in the vicinity of the ovum uh, makes the sperm plasma membrane much more labile so that it can you know the acrosomal reaction can take place. So, this is the first important physiological change that, that is uh, important for the process of capacitation. Second is the loss of particular proteins or carbohydrates, probably those which block the recognition sites for binding to Z uh, ZP on the sperm surface. So, Z P is the zona pellucida. So, what happens is that we look, when we look at the mechanism of internal fertilization, the sperm actually has to bind to the uh, zona pellucida first before reaching the plasma membrane of the ovum. So, this binding is facilitated by certain proteins or carbohydrate receptors on the sperm surface. Now, these loss of particular proteins or carbohydrates uh, that block the recognition sites for binding on the zona pellucidate felicitate the, uh, the for felicitate the fusion of the sperm and the egg and this occurs in the case of capacitation. So, these inhibitory proteins or carbohydrates are removed so that the binding proteins or binding carbohydrate chains can bind uh, the sperm to the uh, zona pellucida and therefore, the mechanism of fertilization can take place. Third important uh, physiological molecular change is that the membrane potential of the sperm becomes more negative as potassium ions leave the sperm. So, there is a change in the electrochemical gradient of the ions. This change in membrane potential may allow calcium channels to be opened and permit calcium to enter the sperm. Calcium and bicarbonate ions may be critical in activating the CAM production and in facilitating the membrane fusion events of the acrosomal reaction. So, as you can see here that you know the calcium intake take place and there is a basically a hyperpolarization of the membrane that occurs because of the uh, removal of the potassium ions. This increases the negativity of the sperm uh, plasma membrane and because of this there is a inside take up of the uh, carbonate ion inside take up of the calcium ions and there is an increase in the camp molecules and this can finally the lead to the fourth molecular change which is the protein phosphorylation. So, there is a pathway that by which the protein phosphorylation can occur and therefore, leads to the uh, sperm to be able to bind to the egg plasma membrane or the capacitation. So, capacitation involves these four molecular changes, removal of the cholesterol. So, as you can see here, the cholesterol efflux due to the albumin cholesterol complex form uh, the second change is basically that the uh, sperm plasma membrane is made labile by the uh, movement of these ions which is like the potassium comes in and the calcium comes in and then the phosphorylation changes that occurs and therefore, you can see that the EMP is converted into CAMP and then there is a there is basically also uh, what is called as the uh, the removal of the inhibition proteins on the surface of the sperm plasma membrane that blocks the sites that bind to the zona pellucida. So, all these molecular changes that are involved in the phenomena of capacitation makes the sperm much more capable of fusing with the uh, with the ovum and this happens only in the vicinity of the ovum and not along the oviduct or the female reproductive tract. So, that premature acrosomal reaction does not take place and it, it does not harm the female reproductive system. So, before entering the ampulla of the oviduct where the mammalian fertilization occurs, the uncapacitated sperm bind actively to the membranes of the oviduct cells in the narrow passage preceding to it. So, in fact, even 
after it has reached the uh, uh, vicinity of the ampullae of the oviduct where the fertilization needs to take place, uncapacitated sperm waits for some time at this isthmus, undergoes the phenomenon of capacitation and then is allowed to move to the ampulla. So, you know the process of capacitation as well as this process of pausing at the isthmus, they all lead to the uh, one consequence which is basically that only the uh, only uh, you know less number of capable and fully functional sperms reaches the egg because as I said the other section of today's talk would be talking about the polyspermy and blocking the mechanisms of polyspermy. So, in mammalian fertilization the norm is that one egg needs to be fertilized by only one sperm. So, to avoid multiple sperms because multiple sperms are ejaculated into the female op or, uh, reproductive tract. So, to avoid multiple sperms to fuse with the ovum these are the mechanisms which are uh, you know put in order. So, the capacitation the uncapacitated sperms would uh, you know in any case be ruled out. Uh, then the sperms which reaches the ampulla is again you know made to reside in the isthmus for some time so that the proper capacitation can take place and only properly oriented and properly functional sperms are finally uh, made to go to the ampulla so that the fertilization can take place. This binding at the isthmus is temporary and appears to be broken when the sperm becomes capacitated. So, you can see that this is the portion which is the isthmus portion and this is the sperm which is bound here. So, sperm just resides here for some time for the capacitation to take place and therefore, the fully functional sperm then moves on to the ampullar regions where the ovum is waiting and the fertilization occurs. So, uh, so the first, uh, you know, step which we talk about is that uh, of the hyperactivation and the chemotaxis. So, hyperactivation is that it has been observed that in certain individuals, the sperms become highly activate, highly active, uh, you know, when it is in the female reproductive tract. So, and moreover, then uh, apart from the, you know, muscular contractions and uh, uterus contractions, there is some kind of factors which is uh, responsible for the, for creating a kind of a concentration gradient and therefore, a chemotactic movement of the sperms takes place to make it show, to make it reach the ovum which is there. So, specific molecules in the female reproductive tract may influence sperm motility and capacitation. When sperm of certain mammals for especially hamsters, guinea pigs and some strains of mice pass from the uterus into the oviducts, they become hyperactivated, swimming at higher velocities and generating greater force than before. Now, chemotaxis was a very important phenomena in external fertilization because in external fertilization, uh, many ova and many sperm, you know, of different species or closely related species are lying at the same place. Now, for species specific recognition, chemotaxis and you know binding of certain factors which are uh, kind of complementary in the sperm and the ovum was very important. So, the sperm actually used to have the direction as well as activation because of these chemotactic factors or chemicals which are around, which are released or secreted outside the ovum that creates a kind of concentration move, uh, gradient that guides the uh, sperm towards the egg. So, it was a very f uh, important phenomena in case of external fertilization. But this phenomena is also not ruled out in case of internal fertilization, although the, uh, the in the internal fertilization, the sperms are released into the female reproductive tract and therefore, there are, uh, you know, different kind of movements which is uh, making the sperm move towards the ovum. Still, there are many more molecules of the female reproductive tract that are responsible for causing the hyperactivation as well as the chemotactic movement of sperm towards the egg. Soluble factors in the oviduct may also provide the directional component of sperm movement as we have talked about. The ovum or more likely the ovarian follicle in which it developed may secrete chemotactic substances that attract the sperm towards the egg during the last stages of sperm migration. So, chemotaxis is not only important in case of external fertilization, but in case of internal fertilization also the chemotactic factors play an important role. So, now the, uh, the sperm has reached the ovum and ovum has also reached the place where the fertilization needs to take place which is the ampulla. The next step in the fertilization is the gamete binding and recognition. Zona pellucida in mammals is a glycoprotein matrix synthesized and secreted by the growing oocyte and it plays two major roles during fertilization. 
first it binds the sperm and second it initiates the acrosomal reaction after the sperm is bound. So, zona pellucida is the glycoprotein complex or a, or a membrane which is secreted outside the plasma membrane. So, the plasma membrane of the, of the ovum which is sometimes called as the vitellin membrane and then there is a zona pellucida and in between there is a space which is called as the perivitellin space. So, this zona pellucida is very much responsible for the binding of the sperm and it also initiates the acrosomal reaction. When we look at the binding of the sperm, it comes to our mind that there must be some certain factors or you know certain protein molecules or certain carbohydrate uh, molecules which will be present both on the sperm plasma membrane as well as on the egg plasma membrane and there must be you know some kind of a complementarity or some kind of an attraction or some kind of a receptor ligand binding sort of thing which will cause the sperm to actually bind to the zona pellucida of the eggs. So, here you can see that binding of the sperm to the, so this is the ovum which is there and this is the cumulus layer and apart from the cumulus layer, this is the zona pellucida. So, this is the plasma membrane, this is the zona pellucida and this is the cumulus layer which is there. So, you can see that the binding of the sperm to the zona pellucida is important as well as causing this acrosomal reaction or breaking up of the acrosomal vesicle and release of the uh, content so that local digestion can take place and finally, the sperm can find its way to the plasma membrane. So, both the mechanisms is uh, basically directed at the uh, binding of the uh, zona pellucida of the egg by the sperm. So, this Zp3 is the specific glycoprotein in the mouse zona pellucida to which the sperm bind. A set of proteins on the sperm recognize specific carbohydrate regions of Zp3. So, Zp3 is that glycoprotein molecule which is responsible for the sperm binding and in particular the sperm recognizes the specific carbohydrate moieties which are present on this glycoprotein Zp3. Zp3 as we said that you know zona pellucida is responsible for another aspect which is the uh, initiation of the acrosomal reaction therefore Zp3 is responsible for that after the sperm has bound to it. The mom sperm can thereby concentrate its proteolytic enzymes directly at the point of attachment at the zona pellucida. So, looking at the acrosomal reaction between the sea urchin which is an example of external fertilization and mouse which is an example of internal fertilization, we can see that unlike the sea urchin acrosomal reaction, the acrosomal reaction in mammals occur only after the sperm has bound to the zona pellucida. So, you can see that this is a jelly layer in case of for example, sea urchin and the acrosomal reaction takes place just at the point the sperm just reaches the jelly layer because this jelly layer it has to pass through and finally reach the egg plasma membrane. So, the acrosomal reaction just starts here. The acrosomal vesicle has broken and the actin uh, below it is going to form this acrosomal uh, uh, process which is going to invade and you know you find its way and then finally it reaches the egg plasma membrane and just goes in. So, this was the uh, in sea urchin, but here you can see that the acrosomal reaction does not take place until the sperm reaches the uh, zona pellucida. So, it is not happening in the jelly layer or the cumulus layer which we are talking about the extracellular coat here, but the acrosomal reaction takes place once it reaches the zona pellucida and then it releases all its enzymes and you can see that it parts, it degrades the zona pellucida and finds its way to the egg plasma membrane. Now, this difference between the acrosomal reaction in sea urchins and mammals may be due to the thickness of the extracellular envelopes surrounding the egg. In the sea urchin, the vitellin envelope is very thin and porous. Once a sperm has bound there, it is very close to the egg plasma membrane and indeed the binding receptor may extend through the vitellin envelope. So, we have seen that on the acrosomal processes there are certain receptors which are called as the binding receptors which are found and we uh, you know and we are uh, and it is speculated that the because the vitellin envelope is quite thin and porous once a sperm is bound there it is very close to the egg plasma membrane and therefore the binding receptor can directly extend there. So, the acrosomal re reaction actually takes place uh, as soon as it reaches the jelly layer of the uh, surrounding the eggs. However, in mammals the zona pellucida is a very thick matrix you know. So, it needs all the enzymes to uh, digest the zona pellucida and finally reach the egg plasma membrane. So, the sperm is far removed from the egg by undergoing the acrosomal reaction directly on the zona 
the sperm is able to concentrate its proteolytic enzymes to lyse a hole in the envelope. So, you know quite uh, quite adaptive difference between the uh, between the egg membranes of the uh, of the eggs of sea urchin and mammals you can see that due to that there is a difference in the uh, in the acrosomal reaction that take place in sea urchins and mammals. The mouse sperm acrosomal reaction is induced by the cross linking of ZP3 with the receptors for it on the sperm membrane. So, we have seen that the zona pellucida of the egg contain these glycoprotein complexes which are called as ZP3 and uh, there are certain receptors on the sperm plasma membrane and the interaction between ZP3 and sperm plasma membrane take place. This cross linking opens the calcium channels to increase the concentration of the calcium in the sperm. So, actual binding is between the ZP3 and the sperm plasma membrane receptor. This is the primary binding. So, you can see this is the capacitated sperm and in the capacitated sperm on the outside sperm plasma membrane there are certain receptors ZP3 binding molecules which bound to the ZP3 molecules on the zona pellucida and this is the first kind of interaction takes place. So, this is the entire acrosomal reaction that there is a binding of the sperm to the zona pellucida there is a uh, digestion, there is an acrosomal vesicle breakdown and you can see that acrosomal vesicle breakdown creates a kind of hole in the zona pellucida and the sperm finds its way to reach the plasma membrane and finally, the fusion of the plasma membrane takes place and the sperm nucleus enters into the egg cytoplasm. Till now, we are seeing the internal fertilization only from the sperm's side. Uh, we will continue with this and look at the, uh, uh, at the uh, uh, internal fertilization from the egg side and we will also talk about the, uh, the, the different mechanisms to block the polyspermy which might occur by the fusion of many sperms with the egg in our next session. Thank you. With this note, thank you ma'am. Thank you so very much for giving us this uh, session on internal fertilization. Dear friends, you are requested to be with us as we are back after a short break and we are going to discuss more. Thank you. Hello friends, welcome back to the session. Friends, you know that today we are talking on internal fertilization and for the discussion on the topic we have with us in our studios, Dr. Charu Dogra Rawat. Dr. Charu Dogra Rawat is a dynamic professor and through her we try to give you in-depth knowledge on various topics and issues. Friends, she is assistant professor in the Department of uh, Zoology, Ramjas College, University of Delhi. If you wish to ask questions from Dr. Charu Dogra Rawat on today's topic, do call us through our toll-free number. Our number is one eight double zero double one zero four three zero. I repeat, our number is one eight double zero double one zero four three zero. Now, I would like to welcome our guest, Dr. Rawat, once again. Hello, ma'am. Welcome back to the session. So, the steps in internal fertilization involves the uh, the gametes to come together at the place of fertilization, and then finally, the binding and fusion to take place. So, in binding and fusion, the important mechanism is the acrosomal reaction we have been talking about. So, acrosomal reaction is when the sperm carries this acrosomal vesicle that breaks down, releases its enzymes so that it can pave its way uh, across the uh, surrounding membranes of the ovum and finally, the sperm plasma membrane and the egg plasma membrane can fuse together. Now, talking about the acrosomal reaction in mammals, we have seen that there are certain 
binding receptors which are certain binding glycoprotein complexes on the zona pellucida and this zona pellucida binds with the certain binding molecules that are present on the sperm plasma membrane and that is the first interaction takes place when the two gametes fuse together. So, this particular ZP3 as you can see the capacitated sperm is there and the ZP3 binding molecule and there are zona pellucida ZP3 proteins that interact with each other. Now, after the acrosomal, during the acrosomal reaction, the anterior portion of the sperm plasma membrane, the region where the ZP3 binding proteins are located is shed from the sperm. So, that plasma membrane region, this, this is the sperm plasma membrane region and the fusion between the sperm cell membrane and adjacent acrosomal membrane is taking place. So, this sperm plasma membrane containing the ZP3 binding proteins, that is basically shed off. So, you can see here that this external uh, thing is shed off and only the internal sperm plasma membrane is now exposed. In mice, it appears that secondary binding to the zona is accomplished by proteins in this inner acrosomal membrane that binds specifically to ZP2. So, you can see that this was the external plasma membrane where the Z, this is a zona pellucida and therefore, this was basically the first interaction that has occurred by the ZP3 molecules. Then there is an internal plasma membrane and then maybe through the ZP2 molecules further binding takes place and this is, this is present in the internal plasma membrane, uh, internal acrosomal membrane of the sperm uh, which is lying there. So, that is the secondary binding that occurs. So, you know first binding and the secondary binding makes sure that there is a sperm and uh, ovum interaction and there is a uh, therefore, which can lead to the fusion of the sperm. Now, for the gamete fusion in mammals, the fertilin proteins in the sperm plasma membrane are essential for sperm membrane egg membrane fusion. Mouse fertilin is located to the posterior plasma membrane of the sperm head. Fertilin binds the sperm plasma membrane to the egg plasma membrane and then to fuse the two of them together. When the membrane are fused, the sperm nucleus, mitochondria, centriole and flagellum can enter the egg. So, these are very important proteins which are present in the sperm plasma membrane. The fertilin proteins located uh, in the uh, posterior plasma membrane of the sperm head that are actually responsible for the binding of the egg plasma membrane to the sperm plasma membrane. So, the egg plasma membrane to the sperm plasma membrane is basically bound by uh, these particular protein molecules. So, inside there are ZP3 interaction, ZP2 interaction and then this fertilin antifertilin reaction which are present uh, between the sperm plasma membrane and the egg mem uh, plasma membrane. Genetic material fusion as you can see here, uh, you know uh, before we go into the genetic material fusion, we can see that the mammalian sperm almost and enters tangentially to the surface of the egg rather than approaching it perpendicularly perpendicularly and fuses with numerous microvilli. So, you can see it is not head down to the uh, to the membrane, but rather it fuses with the membrane sideways or tangentially before it can release the contents such as nucleus, centrioles, mitochondria and flagellum inside the egg. In mammals, the process of pronuclear migration takes about 12 hours as compared with less than 1 hour in the sea urchin. As we have already talked about the pronuclei which is for the sperm pronuclei as well as the female pronuclei uh, when the, when the, uh, you know, when the uh, nucleus uh, takes up water and the uh, contents decondenses then it becomes the pronuclear. So, the sperm pronucleus and female pronucleus fusion also take place at a specified place in the egg and they have to travel to that uh, place or the migration needs to take place which takes around 12 hours in case of mammals as compared to 1 hour in case of sea urchin. Mammalian sperm nucleus also breaks down as it chromatin decondenses and is then reconstructed by coalescing vesicles. So, we have already seen and it is a very similar mechanism that occur in uh, sea urchin that the uh, breakdown into numerous vesicles of the nucleus, uh, the, the nucleus breakdown into numerous vesicles takes place which again coalesce to form. So, there is a vesicular and therefore that, that is called as the pronuclei. 
in the egg cytoplasm glutathione reduces the disulfide bonds of the proteins and allows the uncoiling of the sperm chromatin so we have seen during the differentiation of the sperm uh, in the process of spermiogenesis one important mechanism was the condensation of nucleus uh, to a very higher extent and this was achieved by the replacement of histone proteins in the dna by the proteins proteins so these proteins causes the nucleus the content of the nucleus to condense to a very high order level and that was needed because we want the sperm's head to be as compact as possible now the decondensation of the sperm content takes place because of the egg cytoplasm it contains a certain uh, molecules such as glutathione that reduces the disulfide bonds between the proteins causing the chromatin to decondense and the decondensation of the chromatin leads to the breakdown of the sperm nucleus into vesicles which then coalesce to form give rise to the uh, to the uh, uh, pronuclei or the uh, uh, female pronuclei so mammalian male pronucleus enlarges while the oocyte nucleus completes its second meiotic division so oocyte was arrested at the second meiotic division so while this male pronucleus uh, is uh, expanding or increasing in size the female uh, pronuclei completes its second meiot meiotic division the centrosome or the new centriole accompanying the male pronucleus produces its esters largely from the proteins stored in the oocyte and contacts the female pronucleus so as i said that the male pronuclei as well as the female pronucleus needs to move to a point where the fertilization can takes place so the centriole that is coming along with the mammalian pronuclei uh, gives rise to the asters that connect to the female pronucleus and then each pronucleus migrates towards the other replicating its dna as it travels upon meeting the two nuclear envelopes break down and the fusion takes place so this is how the you know there is a polar body and this is a nuclei and therefore then finally it reaches to a point where they two can go together now instead of producing a common zygote nucleus as happens in sea urchin fertilization the chromatin condenses into chromosomes that orient themselves on a common mitotic spindle so right now you know the breakdown of the nuclei take place but it is not the zygotic nucleus nucleus is not formed until uh, the two cell stage so uh, before that there is basically the condensation of the chromosome takes place that orient themselves on a common mitotic spindle and there is no uh, nuclei formation that occurs until the two cell stage in case of humans now one important phenomena to talk about is that the genetic material of uh, of the male and the female is same except for certain variations so they are basically these carrying the you know the diploid cell is basically because the male and the female genetic material is same except for the sex chromosome however there are evidences that the male the mammalian pronuclei are non equivalent in mammals the sperm derived genome and the egg derived genome may be functionally different and play complementary roles during certain stages of development so they are not equal genomes you know they are uh, the number is same the chromosome is same but the uh, whether they are coming from male or whether they are coming from female they are actually uh, non equivalent the evidence one comes from a human tumor which is called as a hydatidy form mole which resembles the placental tissue uh, hydatidy form uh, mole is shown in the picture here such moles have been shown to arise from a haploid sperm fertilizing an egg in which the female pronucleus is absent after entering the egg the sperm chromosomes duplicate themselves so in that case the diploidy is attained uh, only by the sperm chromosomes and not by the female chromosomes so only the, dip, the it is a diploid thing and there are two uh, genomes but both of them are coming from the male thereby restoring the diploid chromosome number thus the entire genome is derived from the sperm but when this kind of an embryo develops it give rise to this particular human tumor and it does not develop into a proper embryo so this clearly tells that the two pronuclei are non equivalent it's not about two genomes but they have to come from a male and a female there has to be coming from from a sperm and an ovum and the just the duplication of the sperm a uh, chromosome so the duplication of the female chromosome will not produce a viable uh, uh, a viable um, offspring 
and therefore, uh, there is a uh, evidences for the non equivalence of pronuclei. So, another evidence is what is called as the parthenogenesis in which the ova develops in the absence of sperm. So, placing the mouse oocytes in a culture medium that artificially activates the oocyte while suppressing the formation of the second polar body produces diploid mouse eggs whose inheritance is derived from the egg alone. So, as we saw in the hydatid form mole, the development was only because of the sperm and the sperm chromosomes in case of parthenogenesis only the ova is said to develop by its own and the sperm uh, does not uh, give its genetic material. These cells divide to form embryos with spinal cords, muscles, skeletons and organs including beating heartbeats. However, development does not continue and by day 10 or 11 halfway through the mouse gestation, the parthenogenetic embryos deteriorate and become grossly disorganized. Neither human nor mouse development can be completed solely with egg derived chromosomes. So, as I said for a proper normal offspring to be produced, there the chromosomes should be coming from a male and a female. The diploidy attainment of diploidy just by duplicating the sperm's chromosomes or just by duplicating the X chromosomes will not lead to a normal uh, offspring uh, establishing the fact that there is a non equivalence in the female and male uh, pronuclei and both of them are required for the development of a normal embryo. Certain other uh, evidences comes by the uh, pronuclear transplantation experiments. In this case as you can see if this it is a bimaternal uh, you know reconstructed zygote by maternal reconstructed zygote the number of progeny surviving will be 0. In case of bi paternal if the transplants were constructed and there was a bi paternal kind of a reconstructed zygote where the, the you know both the uh, pronuclei were coming from paternal side again the number of progeny surviving was 0. However, if a transplantation experiment was done where one nucleus was of a male and another nucleus was of a female, then there was a viability of at least 18 progeny was surviving. So, there was a successful transplant. In. So, it is not a 100 percent successful case because we are doing a different transplantation experiment, but still the number of progeny surviving was there. However, in case of bimaternal or bipaternal transplantation experiments, none of the progeny survived. The reason for these embryonic deaths is that in some cells only the maternally derived allele of certain genes is inactive while in other cells only the paternally derived alleles of those genes is functional. So, we, we, we have seen in case of genetics when we study that there is a phenomena termed as maternal inheritance. So, there is a phenomena which is called as maternal imprinting or any parental, imp parental imprinting. There is a genomic imprinting which is there. So, that uh, you know kind of things does not occur if it is only coming from a single parent and therefore lead to the non viable offsprings which are there. Now, this fertilization leads to so fertilization when we talk about whether it is external or internal fertilization. The normal fertilization there is a fusion of only one sperm and one egg. But in case of external as well as in case of internal fertilization because sperms or uh, because the eggs are surrounded by a number of sperms there is a possibility that a large number of sperms can fuse with the egg. Now, this polyspermy can be of two types a pathological polyspermy and a physiological polyspermy. Physiological polyspermy in certain individuals is a norm that you know in certain cases more than one sperm only uh, binds to the egg and ovum and uh, but but the fusion takes place only between the uh, single genetic material and therefore the normal embryo can take place although the binding and the fusion of the of the gametes is uh, between is uh, between more than one uh, sperm binding to the ovum and fusing with the ovum, but the nuclear fusion of only one individual takes place. That is that is an example of a physiological polyspermy. However, in most of the cases there is something called as pathological polyspermy in which case what happens is that more than uh, binding of more than one sperm to the ovum leads to a diseased condition and not a normal individual and in fact that kind of an embryo does not survive. 
but because the ovum is surrounded by a number of sperms there is a possibility or there is a chance that more than one can sperm can fuse so there are there are intrinsic mechanisms developed by the uh, by the mechanism uh, inbuilt in the mechanism of fertilization that blocks this polyspermy and tries to prevent this polyspermy because it's lead to the pathological conditions so we will look at those mechanisms for the blocking of the polyspermy that occurs both in case of external and internal fertilization we have already talked about external fertilization but we will just look at one of the fast block polyspermy which occurs in case of sea urchin also so polyspermy is the entrance of multiple sperms into the ovum or fertilize fertilization of ovum with uh, multiple sperms the species have evolved ways to prevent the union of more than uh, two haploid nuclei the most common way is to prevent the entry of more than one sperm into the egg so if an egg can prevent the entry of more than one sperm that is the mechanism which is used most prevalently used or most prevalent for blocking the polyspermy uh, the first is the fast block to polyspermy we'll talk about and this is attained you know within uh, milliseconds of the fusion of one sperm fusing with the uh, egg so as soon as the one sperm is uh, able to fuse with the egg this fast block occurs and this fast block is basically achieved by changing the electric potential of the egg plasma membrane resting membrane potential is generally about 70 mv usually expressed as 70 millivolts because the inside of the cell is uh, negatively charged with respect to the exterior so minus 70 millivolts some uh, we write Uh, maintained by difference in concentration of ions particularly sodium and potassium ions sea water for example has a particularly high sodium ion concentration whereas the egg cytoplasm contains relatively little sodium the reverse is the case with potassium ions the difference in concentration across membrane is maintained by the plasma membrane which steadfastly inhibits the entry of sodium ions into the oocytes and prevents the potassium ions from leaking out into the environment so this kind of differences in concentration leads to the generation of electrochemical gradient and this is basically a minus 70 millivolt electrochemical gradient and this is maintained in the uh, plasma membranes now within 1 to 3 seconds after the binding of the first sperm the membrane potential shifts to a positive level about plus 20 millivolts this change is caused by a small influx of the sodium into in uh, uh, ions into the egg so as soon as one sperm binds the egg the change in the permeability towards the sodium ions takes place and this change in permeability causes the sperm uh, the sodium influx leading to the change in the electrical gradient uh, that changes from minus 70 millivolts to a plus 20 millivolt and this is all a fast block you know because it is happening within 1 to 3 seconds sperms can fuse with membranes having a resting potential of minus 70 millivolts however they cannot fuse with membranes having a positive resting potential so no more sperms can fuse to the egg so this is a mechanism that is developed to block the polyspermy that as soon as one sperm enters the egg or binds to the egg the change in the membrane potential takes place uh, inhibiting any other sperm to bind to the egg most likely the sperm carry a voltage sensitive component positively uh, possibly a positively charged fusogenic protein and the insertion of this component into the egg plasma membrane could be regulated by the electric charge across the membrane an electric block to polyspermy also occurs in frogs so it occurs in sea urchins it occurs in frogs but probably it does not occurs in most of the mammals so this fast block of polyspermy is a very pre- pre- prevalent mechanism uh, but it is not uh, found mostly in the case of mammals so what happens in case of mammals and what happens in the case of other organisms is that uh, that occurs after a few minutes you know 1 to 2 minutes after the sperm has bound and therefore it is termed as the slow block to polyspermy the slow block to polyspermy is termed as a cortical granule reaction this is the slower mechanical block to polyspermy that becomes active about a minute after the first successful sperm egg attachment so what happens in that chron- cr- cortical granule reaction as we have seen in case of sea urchin is that as soon as the sperm binds to these microvilli the cortical granules which are lying inside the membrane of the egg 
they break uh, they fuse with the egg plasma membrane and releases its contents into this uh, egg, uh, perivitellin space. And this perivitellin space as you can see there is a rising of the plasma membrane because the contents just fill in here. There are four different kinds there are proteases, there are hyaluronidases, there are uh, you know different kind of uh, hyaline is there and different proteases is there which are released into this wine. They break uh, break these protein compost this microfilament so that this uh, this membrane is set loose and this gets filled in with the water and therefore it creates this kind of a layer and this layer is now called as the fertilization envelope. So, you can see that the egg plasma membrane this layer just rises up get fills in with the water and creates a kind of a hyaline uh, layer which is important for holding the blastomeres together at the process of cleavage and this fertilization envelope causing causes any other sperm that is bound to the plasma membrane to just knock off. So, it digests the proteins which are present inside the proteases which are present inside the uh, cortical granules uh, uh, clips these posts which are holding these two membranes together releases its content inside and in fact it just uh, kind of breaks the contact of the sperm with the egg plasma membrane and it just you know uh, causes all the sperms to uh, get removed from the egg plasma membrane once one sperm has been able to or is has managed to fuse with the egg plasma membrane. So, this low block to polyspermy occurs after 1 to 2 minutes and this is called as the cortical granule reaction. So, there is an acrosomal reaction from the action towards the sperm side and then there is a reaction from the egg side in the form of the cortical granule reaction. In mammals, the cortical granule reaction does not create a fertilization envelope. So, raising up of the of the membrane or creation of this fertilization envelope does not occur in case of uh, mammals. However, the released enzymes modify the zona pellucida sperm receptor such that they can no longer bind to the sperm. So, we have seen that zona pellucida contains these ZP3 molecules. So, these uh, in case of uh, mammals the cortical granule reaction actually modifies these ZP3 molecules and ZP2 molecules so that they are not able able to uh, create uh, binding with the uh, sperm plasma membrane as a secondary binding or a primary binding and therefore, once one sperm has fused the other sperms are unable to fuse with the same egg. During the process this particular process is called as the zona reaction both ZP3 and ZP2 are modified. So, as I said both the zona pellucida protein ZP3 as well as ZP2 molecules and then there is a cross bridging by ZP1 molecules also. So, ZP3 and ZP2 molecules are modified and this modification during the zona reaction causes the uh, sperm uh, rest of the sperms to just uh, knock off and only one sperm is able to fuse. Cortical granules of mouse eggs have been uh, found to contain the enzymes which are called as the N-acetyl glucosaminidase which are capable of cleaving N-acetyl glucosamine from ZP3 carbohydrate chains. So, at molecular level this is the kind of uh, modification that is occurring that these particular enzymes that are found in the mouse eggs are capable of cleaning cleaving these molecules and acetyl, acetyl glucosamine molecules from ZP3 carbohydrate chains making it unable to serve as a substrate for the binding of other sperm. So, once one sperm has bound all other ZP3 molecules uh, the, uh, in all other ZP3 molecules the cleaving of N-acetyl glucosamine will take place and therefore, it will become unable to bind to any other sperm. ZP2 is also clipped by the cortical granule proteases and loses its ability to bind the sperm as well. So, as we see during the zona reaction both the ZP3 and ZP2 molecules are responsible for uh, for the uh, clipping of the uh, sperms. So, in that case this kind of a fertilization envelope will not be formed. However, whatever content that is released by the cortical granule reaction will lead to the modification of the receptor molecules that are present on the zona pellucida causing 
any other sperms that are bound to the plasma membrane to be knocked off and this is the slower block of the polyspermy that occurs. So, we have talked about the internal fertilization in which we have talked about the fusion of the sperm and the egg plasma membrane. We have already talked about the slow and the uh, faster block to the polyspermy that has occurred and uh, uh, we have talked about the external fertilization. So, the fusion of the two gametes for the fusion of the nuclei or the fusion of the genetic content that leads to the formation of the new offspring is responsible for the uh, uh, is responsible for the uh, formation or the passing up of the genetic material. So, in the development of the embryo, uh, this particular uh, internal fertilization or mammalian fertilization is very important. After the fertilization, when the cleavage takes place, then you know that from the ampullae, the uh, fertilized egg rolls down into the uterus where the implantation takes place that it embeds the uterine epithelium and the development of the embryo starts. So, placentation occurs where the connection between the maternal and fetal takes place and, and the further development of the embryo occurs. So, that uh, with that we end this internal fertilization for today. Thank you ma'am. Thank you so very much for giving us this session on internal fertilization. Dear friends, we believe that you have lots and lots of questions in mind and if you feel so that your questions to be answered, then do write to us at info.cc at nic.in. This is the ID where you can post your questions as well as your feedbacks regarding the lectures too. We are going to meet again very soon and uh, we are going to start up with uh, a new series. Uh, till then, you are requested to keep watching us and keep writing us. Uh, with this note, we are taking your leave. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you once again.